Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voices in Leadership series. This program focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson, and I have the privilege to direct and introduce this program. Part journalist, part diplomat, and part spokesman describes today's speaker, David Ensor. Following a long and visible career in broadcast journalism, he directed Voice of America. The VOA is the official external broadcast arm of the United States federal government, broadcasting in over 45 languages. With 173 million listeners around the globe and a $200 million budget, it was no easy organization to lead. Our guest had to navigate the dueling directives of being a creditable global news source, while at the same time practicing public diplomacy on behalf of the United States government. Before leading the VOA, Mr. Ensor directed communications and public diplomacy for the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. His 31-year 31 31 career as a journalist and uh, spanned work for National Public Radio, ABC News, and CNN. His beats included the White House, the State Department, the National Security Council, along with the rest of the U.S. intelligence community. As a foreign correspondent, he covered Cold War politics, Polish solidarity, as well as wars in Bosnia, Chesnia, El Salvador, and Afghanistan. And in a more peaceful beat, but perhaps not without its own controversy, he covered the travels of the late Pope John Paul II. Mr. Ensor is currently a Shorestein Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. He holds the Knights Medal from the President of Poland and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He received a BA degree in European History from the University of California at Berkeley. Before I turn this session over to Dr. Vish Vishwana, Professor of Health Communications here at the school, and who will conduct today's interview, please join me as we welcome David Ensor to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, that, for that introduction. Uh, let me start by welcoming all of you uh, for joining us today for what I promised to, uh, to be a very interesting conversation for a person who has a very interesting background. So David, welcome. Uh, thank, you. thank you for joining us. Um, this is a very much a student-inspired uh, series. You know, this Voices of Leadership, uh, st our students have uh, always felt uh, uh, a, a, an absence or a lack of this particular aspect of the, uh, you know, in, in public health. You know, so we teach a lot of um, substantive areas and science areas, but leadership is one that they all will have to experience once they leave this uh, uh, leave the school. Uh, and uh, so the students felt uh, uh, very strongly that uh, that they want to hear from leaders who have. Uh, led change in organizations, uh, understand how they made their decisions, uh, what are the principles and skills they have used. Uh, so uh, so that's, uh, so we have had a series of people uh, coming and talking to us and uh, we are very happy that you could come and, and talk to us on your experiences. It's so, a real honor to be here. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me start with, um, uh, with Voice of America, uh, I know it is a it is on your mind uh, given your research and and the paper you are working on as a Shorenstein Fellow. So a reasonable question to ask uh, from an outsider is, uh, Voice of America is a is a taxpayer funded organization, mm -hmm. um, funded by the American taxpayers uh, um, through the government of the United States. Uh, why do we need uh, a, an organization like that? You know, why do we need uh, Voice of America? Uh, and if we do have such an organization, uh, why doesn't it always support the American uh, positions? Okay. The Voice of America is an independent journalistic organization. Uh, there was a battle over that years ago in the 70s um, after the VOA uh, was covering Vietnam and Watergate and the Nixon administration uh, wanted to censor it, but it was decided in a law that was passed in 1976 by Congress and signed by President Ford that VOA would be independent, not a spokesman for the U.S. for whoever's the president and the administration of the day, a voice of America, not a voice of the U.S. government. 
So yes, we don't necessarily always try to make America look wonderful and, and advocate for the administration. If there's an Abu Ghraib scandal, we cover it. I say we. I used to be part of it. Um, an Abu Ghraib scandal, um, if Edward Snowden is revealing some things about uh, NSA activities, we report it. If there is a, uh, uh, if, if there's a big story around anger in Ferguson, Missouri over police killings of young black men, we report on it. I send reporters from all, speaking all different languages to Ferguson to report on it. And in, in a way, it's a teaching moment because it allows uh, people in sometimes not such pleasant regimes uh, that they're living in mm -hmm. to see how a democratic country deals with its issues and its challenges and its problems and its flaws, which is openly. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, uh, we peaceably assemble. Mm -hmm. We have freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. My paper here at Harvard is titled Exporting the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. That is what Voice of America does. Mm -hmm. So one might ask, uh, so why do we need Voice of America? criticizing and reporting on the U.S. or other parts of the world when there are other news organizations um, which are also doing this, whether it is BBC or ABC or CBS or NBC. Right? Look, uh, uh, the organizations, well, mm -hmm. the CNN, you did, you, uh, you know, and some of the other organizations, pro most of these are for-profit organizations. Right. Mm -hmm. There's money to be made in broadcasting in English globally, mm -hmm. and there are companies doing that, and mm -hmm. good, good for them. Mm -hmm but they're not broadcasting in Hausa mm -hmm. or Tigrina mm -hmm. or Amharic mm -hmm. or uh, Farsi mm -hmm. or Russian. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the U.S. has determined that it wants to be able to communicate with a large number of people mm -hmm. around the world uh, where possible in their mother tongues so that a wider group can be, can be reached. Uh, in Mali, when there were Islamists moving from north to south and uh, uh, blowing things up and and, and killing people and, and knocking out, by the way, FM radio towers mm -hmm. from stations that we were affiliated with. Mm -hmm. um, we, we started a new service in Bambara. We had broadcasting in French already, but French only reached about 15% of the population, and very few of them female or young. By putting Bambara on, we suddenly had a way to speak to the greatest number of Malians with, with reliable news information. Um, and I believe that was a powerful expression of American support for the people of Mali. Mm -hmm. It's one of the ways to do it. Give them something they can really use. Mm -hmm. So you're very articulate in, in identifying a particular role for Voice of America vis-a-vis -vis other types of uh, news organizations. So the one, one question is, you, know, you are reporting uh, from a country, or you're located in a country where First Amendment is highly valued, uh, First Amendment being a prescription by the Congress not to interfere. Uh, so how do you sell this idea? How do you really uh, articulate this idea in, in places uh, where uh, the same values uh, are not, uh, uh, you know, are, are cherished or are, are accepted? So. I'm not, I, need, I think you need to expand on that. I'm not quite sure what you mean because, I, I mean, if you mean that that how do we say that to a country where there's a repressive mm -hmm. regime? I th we're not talking to the repressive mm -hmm. regime. We're talking to the people of that country. But and you are reporting from repressive regimes, right? Sometimes you, if you are reporting from Mali or reporting from Iran or reporting from some of these regimes, so how do you, how do you, and how do you make sure that and, and tell people that you know, it's important for them to really understand the American values of First Amendment and free. Well, let's take Iran and, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost 25 percent, 23 or 4 percent of the Iranian public watches at least one VOA television program mm -hmm. each week. We have huge reach in Iran. Um, I, I, I used to say when I was in communist Poland as an ABC correspondent that I was living in the most pro-American country on earth, <laughs> communist Poland. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays I would argue to you that uh, Iran might be the most pro-American country on earth. You wouldn't think that from what you hear the mm -hmm. government saying. Mm -hmm. But the people of Iran are fascinated by the United States. They want more freedom than they have right now. Mm -hmm. And they, they tune into VOA television uh, in very large numbers. So it's not like there's a problem there. Uh, the issue is to give them really reliable news. And, uh, you know, it's a contentious place. There's lots of different views. Mm -hmm. um, uh, running a, 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 an Iranian news organization in Washington is a complex and, 
and uh, contentious business, mm -hmm. but very important mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And in this period when we've had the nuclear deal made, mm -hmm. um, uh, Iranians along with the rest of the world have been hanging on the edge of their seats to see whether it would happen or not. Um, uh, and Persians would wake up in the morning and with coffee they want to know what is Washington saying about us. Mm -hmm. So VOA was very well placed to tell them exactly that. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, make sure that, uh, so I, I think a part of or a substantive part, substantial part of what VOA does and for its success is the credibility it brings, right? And, mm -hmm. and the sense of um, independence from, from American government. Uh, how do you communicate that? How do you make sure that, that your listeners and uh, people who are your sources of news uh, understand that, appreciate that, and, and uh, accept that? Well, because we cover, as we are required to do by law under the VOA Charter of 76, we cover all sides of an argument. If there's a debate about, well, I'll take the Iran nuclear deal and continue with it. We put Bibi Netanyahu's speech to Congress mm -hmm. on the air in Farsi back to Iran. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we had been the voice of the White House, I'm not sure we would have been doing that. <laughs> we were, what we were doing was saying, here's a country where we're open, where we listen to everybody where there are many critics of the Iran nuclear deal, including the Israeli Prime Minister who's speaking to our Congress. Mm -hmm. Here, why don't you listen to him? So the point was, this is how an open country, how a free country deals with issues. We argue about them. Mm -hmm. We listen to all sides. Mm -hmm. And somehow in the end, we come to a resolution which is generally, more often than not, the right one. Nice. So um, let's talk about leadership. So as a leader mm -hmm. of a organization such as the Voice of America, uh, you are, I'm, uh, I'm assuming, that caught between your reporters who value professional autonomy uh, in terms of how they do their job and what they want to report on within the organizational mission and charter, and then Congress and other stakeholders uh, who may be critical of, of uh, the way you're covering uh, some of these issues. So as a leader, what, are, what is your role and, and, and how do you balance and navigate a situation like this? P part of the job of the VOA director of any major news organization's head or editors is to listen to critics mm -hmm. and check what they're, what they're saying. Um, I had a senior official, uh, perhaps I won't identify too more specifically than that, mm -hmm. uh, calling me in one day and saying, look, we're getting complaints from country X about your coverage of human rights there. They think it's excessive. And I wouldn't be bothering you about this, but this is a country that helps us a lot on national security issues. Mm -hmm. So they've kind of earned the right for me to at least raise the issue with you. And I said, excellent. Can you give me the details of what it is they object to? May I know what they feel is wrong about it? Are there journalistic problems? Mm -hmm. Because if there are, I'm all over this. We're going to work on this. If, there are, if there's a, a, a bad sourcing, bad writing, we want to correct it. Well, no, they didn't have any, any examples. They just didn't like that we're covering human rights in their country. So I said, well, thank you very much. And I did absolutely nothing in response to that complaint. Nothing. Because that was my job. The US government has to be able to work with regimes that may not always be too attractive on human rights issues and work with them on national security issues. And that's great. That's the State Department's job. That's the White House's job. My job is to, was until recently, to run a journalistic organization that's honest about the issues facing a particular population. And in that country, human rights was definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. And we didn't uh, trim ourselves in the least bit. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some of the, so listening to uh, other people and stakeholders is an important uh, asset and a skill for a leader. What are some of the other leadership skills that people should have and, uh, in, in running such huge complex organizations? I think when you first arrive at a big new, uh, a big organization, the first thing you need to do is make it clear to your team that you believe in their mission, that you are at the core, the, the basic principles of that organization. You get what they are, you can articulate them, and you believe in them strongly. You will defend them. You will fight for them if necessary and for the mission of the people in that team. Mm -hmm. I think it's the first thing you have to do. Um, then you need to say, maybe say, if it's necessary, and it often is, but I'm a change agent. We don't have to do everything the way we've always done it. I'm partly here to look for ways, better ways to do what we do. The mission must stay the same, 
the way we tackle it might change in a changing world. Um, and then I think you just say your door is open, um, you articulate a strategy, and you better have one. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, you, I've certainly learned, um, you know, I'm a kind of chatty person, but the leaders of an organization cannot gossip. And another thing is that uh, in many cases, praise is worth more than money. When you can, when you can, when you find a way to be able to tell people they're doing a good job when they are, mm -hmm. That's worth so much, makes such a difference. Um, so even if you don't get a budget increase and can't give everyone a raise, mm -hmm. tell them how good they're, what a good job they're doing when they are. Mm -hmm. It's so valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's very helpful. Those are very interesting skills one should have. Let me push you a cup uh, on a couple of them, you know, and to see how you do them in um, in practice and operationally. Yeah. So when you say your door is open. Um, um, literally or figuratively. Uh, so if you have a 1,700 people organization, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them have opinions and want to share with them, with you, you know, in person or email. Uh, um, at the same time, you're also running a very complex bureaucracy. I mean it in a very rational way, right? You have departments, organizations, divisions. Yeah. How do you balance between paying attention to these issues uh, that people want to talk to you about, your employees want to talk to you about, yet you have to also manage the organization in terms of making sure that it's running day to day uh, in a very efficient way, yet have a vision for the future. Yeah. Uh, so how do you manage in terms of time, priorities? You know, Time and resource management are the big issues when you're dealing with such a large organization, and it's an incredible challenge, you're right. It's not like anybody can just walk into the office of the director any minute they want to and mouth off for 20 minutes. You know, you can't afford to do that. You have to have a good doorkeeper who's smart. And I had one of the best. She was a former uh, Air Force sergeant, and she knew, she knew how to, on the one hand, she knew what was important. She knew who really would need to talk to me or who I really should hear from. She, but she would check out what was, what was what first. But the other part of what you're talking about is basically delegating. You need to pick good deputies. I mean, part of a senior manager's job is managing the managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say to, to, to and, and, and that means setting a strategy, making clear what it is, mm -hmm. and then picking good deputies, and then getting out of the way and letting them implement the strategy. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to say to them, look, I know you're going to make a few mistakes along the way. I have your back, okay? I mean, I, I will tell you privately if mm -hmm. I think you're making a mistake, but fundamentally, I have your back. I will protect you within reason. Uh, because I want you implementing, and I don't want you to be afraid. I, I want you to make some moves. Don't be timid. So um, part of it is, I say, ma managing, managing the managers and not micromanaging them, yeah. letting them have their head. And then when you do need to replace someone, if possible, um, do it with public praise and a soft landing place because mm -hmm. this person has tried their best. They've done what they could, and presumably if you hired them to be a deputy, Mm -hmm. um, you, you value their contribution even if it doesn't m meet what you need now. Mm -hmm. So let me, uh, so what makes a good deputy or a good manager good? What are you looking for? Because recruitment is always a challenge, right? When you're recruiting, one of the biggest mistakes we make as leaders and managers is, is in recruitment. Once you have them in place, it's a great thing. So what, what do you look for? How do you make those decisions? Part of it is science, maybe, but part of it is gut. But how do you make those decisions? Yeah, it's not a science or an art, I don't think. It's sort of a craft. Mm -hmm. uh, you, learn, uh, you learn by doing mm -hmm. um, how to pick the, right, the best people. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for a mix of, uh, you, you want someone who's going to have credibility with the workforce, mm -hmm. who hopefully has come from the workforce, but really knows the business mm -hmm. that we're in, whatever that business is, in our case, a news business. Um, who people will look up to because they'll say well, he 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 knows he or she knows what I what I do they did it once or at least they really understand it and can articulate what it is. But you're also looking for somebody who isn't just trying to get promoted, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just because they want the money or the big office or whatever. You want somebody who has who can articulate to you privately in the job interview what it is they think needs to be done in a way that makes sense. Um, and where you get the sense that they're going to be a change agent. Because we don't become leaders 
just to sit in offices and feel good about the uh, size of the office. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I was very much about trying to increase the audience of the Voice of America. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that it, while I was director, it increased by 40 percent, mm -hmm. up to 188 million people uh, per week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we did that in some key countries that are quite challenging, mm -hmm. difficult countries, uh, countries that are not free, mm -hmm. uh, among others. So I wanted to get my division directors to really understand what our goals were, mm -hmm. make them simple, make them clear, mm -hmm. and then give them room to maneuver. Mm -hmm. So one um, follow-up question on, on leadership and motivating your employees. What are some of the ways you can communicate, especially in an organization, such a complex organization, where you're possibly your reporters are not in Washington, D.C., but all over the world, uh, to make sure that, that they are buying into your leadership, your values, uh, your vision. Uh, at the same time, you are able to listen to them and their concerns. You've got to be positive. Um, above a certain level in management, negative doesn't work. Um, uh, you have to lead by positive example. Mm -hmm. You have to both. You have to walk the walk, mm -hmm. and you have to um, lead by praising the best work, mm -hmm. the work that you want, the kind of work you want to see. Mm -hmm. Point that out, elevate it. Mm -hmm. But um, if you have, if you're worried about something or there's a problem, deal with it. But deal with it quietly mm -hmm. is my advice to other leaders, mm -hmm. if you can. If you can, sometimes you have to beat, meet something frontally, mm -hmm. but uh, and when you have to, you have to. Mm -hmm. If there's a, a story that's just plain wrong, mm -hmm. I would occasionally go out with a statement myself to say the story was wrong. We apologize. You know, we're doing 1,600 hours a week. It can't all be right, uh, but I see we see where the problem is. I've, we've identified it, and this is not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. This particular mistake. Mm -hmm. This is very helpful. So let me move from. A managing and leading an organization during routine operations and knowing something about journalism and reporting, it's never routine. Right. Uh, but uh, to managing an, and leading an organization during crisis. So I would be remiss if I don't uh, talk about the sad events uh, and dismaying events over the last uh, week or so and the week before that in Beirut and Paris. Yeah. Uh, where you know, all of our attention is focused on these events. And how, so my question is, you know, uh, and you have covered a number of crises, uh, both as a reporter and uh, as, as a leader of a major news organization. So how do you, how is, what are the differences in, in, in leadership? What kind of skills are required when there is a crisis as opposed to when it's a non-crisis period? So. Uh, there's that famous quote from uh, the mayor of Chicago, never waste a crisis. <laughs> um, and uh, that's even more true for journalists. Actually, a crisis, I hate to say this, is kind of an opportunity for journalists. Um, journalism is, has, has a, a vulture side to it. Uh, bad news for others is great news for journalists. They get interesting work to do. Uh, of course, you, you don't want to gloat. but. Uh, the, the, the key uh, when a terrible thing like what has happened in Paris happens is to cover it really, really well. And well means accurately. Um, for a news organization like Voice of America, I mean, there's two high principles in journalism. One is to be first and the other is to be right. Mm -hmm. um, which order do you put them in? That mm -hmm. depends what kind of a news organization you are. For Voice of America, we want to be right. We don't have to be first. We want to be right. Mm -hmm. So the stress for our journalists in a, in a breaking news situation like, like Paris or any number of other cases, mm -hmm. you know the first information is almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a truism, but it's, but it's often true. So be, you, is caution, um, a great care to be accurate with what you are saying. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is the highest goal for, for certainly for Voice of America journalists mm -hmm. and maybe for all journalists. Mm -hmm. It's great to be first, it's great to break a story, but more than anything else we want to be a respected, credible voice. We want to get the story right while covering it aggressively, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, a big story like Paris is an opportunity for any news organization mm -hmm. to shine. Mm -hmm. And what you don't want to do is get some major piece of the story wrong mm -hmm. and then have spent a lot of time uh, correcting mm -hmm. yourself in public. Mm -hmm. So let me um, ask you about that, the particular uh, crisis situation. So as a leader, uh, you have your uh, you have to motivate your employees. You have to make sure that they are seeing the mission and putting the mission of the organization 
uh, it's central to their um, practice. Uh, and at the same time, you have to manage their welfare, you have to worry about their safety and security, even while you're sending them to cover these very complex and possibly life-threatening situations. Uh, so as a leader, how do you manage that? How do you, you know, we in public health may send our uh, employees to crisis with, when there are pandemics like Ebola. So how do you how do you make those decisions? How do you manage those crises? What kind of resources and skills do you draw on? Well, you mentioned yes. a health crisis, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking about Ebola as, mm -hmm. as we sit here, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking back to our coverage there, mm -hmm. and I was worried about my journalists who were in Liberia mm -hmm. and, and Sierra Leone, and I was worried about their health and mm -hmm. safety, and we all were. And we, th we worked to try to make sure that those who did go in and those who did go into the health area, the riskiest areas, mm -hmm were properly uh, equipped and were very, very knowledgeable about how to keep safe mm -hmm. and so forth. And we tried to minimize their exposure. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, this tragic thing that happened mm -hmm. in West Africa was a big international news story. Mm -hmm. It needed to be covered and mm -hmm. covered well. So you try to, ha try to balance those imperatives. Mm -hmm. And I guess it helps me that I once covered pandemics and wars myself mm -hmm. and had to find that balance in my own self as to what I was ready to do. Um, many journalists are kind of young and, and eager and they have a tendency and they want to be, they want to get that story and they may sometimes take more risk than, than, than they should. So uh, the leaders, often older like myself, um, who hopefully have been there, are, are try to moderate things. I know you want to go get the story and yes, please do get the story, but you don't need to go to that extra village to the one where almost everyone's dead. You, you could go to the one where, where, where you can tell the story, see the pictures, and probably not have quite as much risk. Please do that instead. You know? So uh, it's finding the right balance between aggressively covering the news and not having um, you know, physical risk to the people who are doing it. Let me ask you uh, for some advice um, as a leader, as, especially as a leader from the media industry. Uh, so those of us who are in public health and science are somewhat loath to talk to journalists <laughs> and the media. Uh, or dare I say, um, the relationship is always tense, mm -hmm. most often. Yet, journalists could be extremely powerful allies, especially in crises like this. So what advice do you have for our students who, are, who will go on to become leaders in dealing with the media, dealing with journal journalists, and understanding journalism and how it could be helpful or harmful. Just like doctors, journalists are varied and have different specialties. My advice to your students is if you are, uh, because, because journalists can be your best allies. If, you've, if, if, if you're trying to um, make people understand the health, public health risk of something or understand a breakthrough, um, there's no better way. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess what I'd first suggest is, when possible, deal with expert journalists. Um, uh, talk to and work with journalists who actually cover health care, because there are some fabulous people who are really um, uh, expert in their field, some of them doctors themselves, who, who cover health news today. And gravitate to them would be my first suggestion because they can be your allies and they have greater depth and understanding of what it actually is that you do and why you do it and so forth. Um, I'm a great believer in beats. I tried to encourage my reporters at Voice of America. We tried to develop some new beats. We ha you know, have specialized journalists who do nothing but X and do it really well. Mm -hmm. um, it's satisfying for them. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to break stories. And when they're dealing with the professionals in the field, which could be healthcare or something else, they're much more likely to find common ground, mm -hmm. and the piece that they will produce will be more interesting in mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. So I like specialists, mm -hmm. and, and, and when possible, I suggest to healthcare professionals, look for healthcare journalists mm -hmm. who specialize in covering that subject when you can. Mm -hmm. So you, you said very well who we should talk to. What should we say, and what should we not say? Uh, I have often seen interviews uh, where the journalists have some working hypotheses um, and they want you to talk about confirming those working hypotheses and the uh, scientists, public health leaders, scientists and others who have uh, certain jargon that they want to 
use and talk about uh, from, from their perspective. So how do you balance it? What should we prepare for as we go, uh, work and uh, with the media, especially both in times of crisis and other, other situations? Well, plain English helps a lot. Um, it, 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 jargon does not generally work very well, whatever jargon, and I'm not saying it in a pejorative way. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of jargon in various different fields, and, and understandably so, you know, kind of inside talk, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work with the general public. If you're sitting here with a camera rolling, speak plain English. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, work a little bit beforehand if you're going to go in front of a camera mm -hmm. on how, what are my terms that I'm going to use for things. You know, I can't use that that acronym or that, uh, thing, that, that a Latin name for a disease or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not going to work. So what am I, before you start, pre-plan it, maybe practice it mm -hmm. uh, with somebody. Get ready, mm -hmm. uh, because this is an opportunity. This is not something to be afraid of. This is your opportunity to r reach a lot of people with your ideas, your insights, and perhaps you can help them in some very important ways. Mm -hmm. Don't waste it. Mm -hmm. Get ready carefully, as I guess what I would first say. Mm -hmm. So from a specific issue, I want to step back a little bit on more general uh, leadership issues and the type of organizations. Uh, as we were talking earlier, um, um, some organizations make shoes, widgets, uh, you know, very specific concrete products. Mm -hmm. um, and then some organizations make very creative products, songs, movies. Um, soap operas, and there are organizations which fall in between and are more, more factually oriented news products. Mm -hmm. So these are very, these are organizations making very different products. And my question is, are leadership skills common among all of them? Or are they different? Do they vary? Uh, what kind of skills do you need for a creative organization with highly autonomous employees, like in public health, who are highly educated as opposed to something? Else. I mean, in my own experience, you know, there are some real differences between private sector work and, and uh, public. Mm -hmm. um, I told you the story before. I'll just be brief on it now. Uh, uh, I, one of the reasons I joined VOA, having been a commercial journalist for many years, was, I mean, I loved being an ABC correspondent and traveling the world and so forth. But um, I, when I was in Afghanistan as a diplomat, um, I was struck by how the coverage by people that I would have been one of, mm -hmm just a few years earlier, uh, you know, had a tendency to be under the heading of if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. You know, bad news is good news. Because uh, 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 commercial broadcasting and commercially, you know, commercial journalism, mm -hmm. newspapers that have to sell, I mean, frank, bad news sells, frankly. That's human nature. Mm -hmm. every, every focus group, every poll has shown that. Mm -hmm. But what I liked about working for Voice of America and when I was inspired by their coverage in Afghanistan when I saw it, was, you know, if, if 100 new health clinics were open last month, that's news, you know. That's news, too. Sure, you want to cover the explosions and the people getting killed. Yeah, yeah. But we have to. But the fact that 100 new health clinics have opened, mm -hmm. specializing in maternal health care, whatever, that's a news story, too. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. something that Afghans wanted to know about and take pride in. Mm -hmm. So there was, I felt, in the, sometimes in the public sector of journalism, a little bit more of a broader perspective, not just profit-based, which gave you kind of a more a better balance, I thought. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of commercial journalism. I love what we did at ABC News, and, and, and I'm very proud of it. I'm not in any way derogating it except to say mm -hmm. there's a place for public, for the public sector as mm -hmm. well, in mm -hmm. journalism mm -hmm. and in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an old uh, journalism colleague of mine used to say um, that we train journalists right from, say, Journalism 101 classes onwards to cover bad news very well, but we don't train them in writing about good, good news stories. What do you say to that? Well, uh, it, that, if that's true, it's for the reason I just described, right. that there's a, there's a for-profit business that makes money mm -hmm. covering bad news. And, and bad news is important. Mm -hmm. People want to know about it. They're not wrong. Um, uh, if something uh, terrible like Paris has happened, everyone's transfixed, everyone's on the television. Mm -hmm. CNN's got the best ratings it's had, I'm mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. you know, in, in many weeks because there's a big, not so good news story and everyone wants to know, how's this going to turn out? How's, how's this going to affect my security? Mm -hmm. Very legitimate human desire. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I'm just saying that uh, that uh, it's in some ways harder to cover good news because mm -hmm. you how do you keep people interested in it? But if you do it well, it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think VOA in particular, because it covers world, it, 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 it covers news in many places in the world where there's not much good news. Mm -hmm. When there is good news, that's something, mm -hmm. and people want to know about it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it well, uh, you can inspire them, mm -hmm. and that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. And so when when uh, so let me step up a little bit as we are talking about general nature of these news organizations. So you have uh, VOA, and, uh, which is uh, covering what, 75 uh, uh, different uh, languages, 45 different Four, languages. 45 language. plus, yeah. Um, and so how do you um, recruit people? Uh, how do you, uh, we, we talked a little bit about recruitment of managers, but what, what do you, how do you uh, look at the kind of values they have, the skills they have, in addition to reporting when you recruit people like that? Yes. Um, the most important thing a journalist needs to have is curiosity and um, uh, a willingness to ask good, que and, and a good brain, ability to ask good questions. Um, and then writing skills obviously are important, writing and presenting. So we look for those qualities um, and we've been fortunate. Not only do we have some really terrific, I say, I'm still saying we, I haven't gotten out of the habit of it, but understand I'm not at VOA anymore. I just wish them well. Um, uh, we've got, VOA has some really fine journalists in its newsroom, uh, both Americans and um, many hyphenated Americans, Americans from other parts of the world. Uh, and then there are stringers who may not be American mm -hmm. citizens at all. Um, Frankly, we've been able to say, VOA has been able to say, say, say it, VOA wanted to expand in Indonesia, which it did at one point. It was able to go to some of the best journalists in Indonesia, mm -hmm. some of the top, most respected names, and say, how would you like to move to the United States? How would you like to put your children in the University of Virginia? Mm -hmm. um, how would you like to, to join this great American experiment mm -hmm. and practice the trade you do so well? in the language you know. That's a pretty tempting offer. Mm -hmm. And some of the best journalists on earth have taken up that offer and are now at the Voice of America. So it's a powerful organization. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great mix. And it's, it's a little bit like the United Nations. There's always somebody's national day happening and, and the food from that, that, that nation is being offered in the hallways and so <laughs> forth. It's a lot of fun mm -hmm. um, uh, because it's such a sort of melting pot. Mm -hmm. And in that diversity, I mean, just like America writ large, in that diversity there is tremendous strength. You know, we have an in-depth knowledge of cultures and, and peoples around the world that almost no other news organization has. I'm such a believer in the idea of diversity and the fact that it gives an organization, particularly a news organization, you know, extra strength. I'm so happy you, you raised this issue of diversity, uh, given everything that's happening in the country today and you know, all the yeah. things we are facing. Uh, so how do you manage uh, such diverse group of people uh, from very diverse backgrounds, ideologies, and cultures, uh, yet make them see the common mission? Uh, how do you promote diversity at the same time promote the sense of common purpose as a leader? I mean, first, uh, you promote diversity by being inclusive, by uh, uh, being um, results-based and trying to get the best candidates for jobs no matter what, and with an eye to having a diverse workforce, with an eye to having a diverse leadership. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't be shy, I'll say that. Um, some of the cultures that people come from uh, have very different backgrounds and values a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I've had to say to some of the sort of division directors who come from other parts of the world, you know, you're not a queen, you're not a king. Um, we, we work inclusively here, and uh, to lead is to serve. I need you to take that attitude with you every day as you lead mm -hmm. your fellow countrymen or the people from your area. You want to lead them in, in an American way, which is an inclusive way. Um, maybe they're from a different tribe or a different part of the country than you came from. Mm -hmm. They are equal to you, mm -hmm. you know. 
And if, and, and if they succeed, you are succeeding. Mm -hmm. If they're failing because of some kind of sense that you think you're the king and you decide everything, mm -hmm. um, then you're going to be a failure because mm -hmm. that isn't going to work here in the federal workforce of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. right. So let me um, ask you one last question as we are running out of time here. Um, so uh, we often hear that journalists have a sense of objectivity as a uh, principle or value that they use in, in covering uh, events. Uh, and, uh, and some of them are dealing with uh, uh, people who are good, some of them are distasteful. Um, and and people talk about issues such as you know I'm a neutral reporter and I just cover news I just report what is happening. Yeah. So and you often uh, have said in the past you know um, quoting uh, a very eminent uh, politician that we are not necessarily neutral. What do you think of what principles and core values do we have? Uh, are we really so object and neutral that we? Just report. This is quite a this is quite a hot topic among journalists. Mm -hmm. I, I have a colleague at the Shorenstein Center, uh, very very an excellent journalist, who's mm -hmm. been covering uh, affairs and matters in Syria recently. Very dangerous work, mm -hmm. and he said to me, you know, I go into a place where they've all got guns, and I'm trying to get the news as to what they're saying there, and they point their guns at me, and I say, hey, don't don't I I I, I just want to tell your story. I'm neutral. And I've said to him, no, you're not. You're not neutral. I mean, I get why you say that. And I totally see why in that context with the gun pointed at you, you're going to say that. And, 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 and you know, you're saying, I just want to, I'm just here to tell your story. I'm, it's sort of in your interest to let me come in peace and get the story. But the fact of the matter is journalists are not and should not be neutral. Um, and if I may, I'm just going to read a, a, a quotation on this from uh, a, a very distinguished former journalist, Adam Clayton Powell III. He was a former executive at CBS mm -hmm. News and NPR. And he recently said this, to state the obvious, not everything is true. Some things are provably false. Not everything is equivalent. Some things are repulsive to humanity. Today the choice is clear. Seizing neighboring countries' territory by force is not just another ideology. Shooting down civilian airliners, whether Korean Airlines 747 or Malaysian 7077, is not just another point of view. Jailing political opponents in Havana or Caracas is not just an alternative lifestyle. Mass enslavement of women and girls by ISIS is not just another way to exercise power. Mass kidnapping of African boys and forcing them to become soldiers is not just another way to govern. These are by any objective standard practices which civilized people everywhere can and do condemn. These are by any objective standard practices that the best journalism can and should expose. So journalism with values, that's what's that's what's worth doing. On that inspiring note, let us thank uh, David for his wonderful and articulate uh, statements about leadership and journalism. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>